Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, J.R. Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. Without further ado... All right, today we get to bring you a science fiction author, Drew Avera. He is a U.S. Navy veteran who's still on active duty. He gets to play with jets for a living. Um, <laughs> I've stole his bio because I'm lazy. So I know he started writing career in 2012 with his NaNoWriMo novel. And since then, he's published more than 20 novels, novellas, and short stories, and has been featured in the best-selling Future Chronicles Yay! anthologies. Yeah! Woo-hoo! <laughs> Navy, that's like almost military, right? Oh, we're just one notch above Puddle Pirate. Uh, I mean, Coast Guard. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, so okay, I'm still above the to my course, list of so things to say. <laughs> but it's cool, though, because Marines ride in our cars. So, you know. Yeah, well. So you're like the Uber driver. Yeah, the, right. we're Uber drivers for the Marine Corps. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, what do you um, – since we're interviewing you, if we sound like idiots listeners, we're sorry. This is our first ever interview. So we're still learning. <laughs> um, but what do you love about science fiction, Drew? Well, I think the thing that draws me more to science fiction would be the technology – uh, with fantasy, it's swords, magic, uh, a lot of people in deserts. Uh, that doesn't really thrill me as much as science fiction when everybody's in big spaceships and using technology that far exceeds what we have now. Uh, especially in the 80s and 90s when I was a kid, you see something like Star Trek and they're using these tablets and have these holographic things. I'm like, wow, when I'm an adult, I can't wait to have that. And here I am, uh, an adult, and still don't have it. It's and a no flying car. <laughs> yeah, no flying cars, no hovercraft. I feel like the 80s lied to me. But, uh, <laughs> they did. They did. Although, yeah, they did. I, too, I too love the uh, hollow rooms in Star Trek as a kid. I wanted one. Oh, man. Teleportation? I mean, the, I think part of the thing about teleportation that got me so much – thrill as a kid was the fact that my dad was a truck driver so he was gone for days and weeks at a time but i was thinking if i could teleport i could see him like every day so uh i think just the different technology and stuff uh and and me being an idealist for the future is really what drew me to science fiction initially um, now that I'm a fully functioning adult and I can use my brain a little bit, I can see how, Says who? well, I mean, somebody said, I could. <laughs> uh, I don't have an alibi for that, but, um, the social commentary, uh, is a lot easier to take in the science fiction genre than it is. If you were to just put it out there in a different type of fiction, you can use alien races to discuss, uh, things like civil rights and it's right. a little bit more accessible and uh because of that i think science fiction has the biggest allure for me right i i didn't even notice that in in star trek until i got older but all the messages right. even even star trek the next generation they say a lot of things and the the message was easier to take because the aliens seemed innocent right you know innocent maybe naive and we got to see their mistakes and not to actually take it personally because they weren't even human. Yeah, and uh, with Star Trek, it was pretty interesting because they wanted a society that was fully functioning and everybody had the same place in that society. So there was none of that women can't do something because they're a woman or right. people of different races couldn't do stuff because they were a different race. Everybody on the bridge well, she- of the Enterprise was, they had diversity and that diverse culture was a strength for that show. And I think if we have a good view of the future and kind of follow something along with that, it would be a valuable thing Hmm. to embrace. So I, I will say that's the good thing about science fiction. On the one hand, you can't pretend that biology doesn't exist. So there are physical differences and limitations between the average man and the average woman. But what science fiction allows you to do is get around that with technology. If everybody's in powered armor, does it really matter? And so I think I think that's where you know science fiction has the strength over some of the other genres, and makes it more believable. Right, especially cyberpunk. I mean, you get 
14 year old girl with bio, uh, what is it, uh, mechanical arms and stuff she can do. Oh, sure. Biomechanical implants in her head and she can take over robots. (laughs) She can bench press more than three of us combined. Right. (laughs) The ultimate equalizer. (laughs) As long as she does her homework first. I thought Samuel Colt was the ultimate equalizer. Oh, now we're talking about battle armor, bionic arms, and the ability to hack a computer from a thousand miles away using your ear. <laughs> <laughs> no, still, Sam Colt. You know, it's that expression during the Civil War. They said, uh, God made man and Sam Colt yeah. made him equal. Yeah, that was. <laughs> but, that's a century but anyway, ago. We, we already so, forgot about that. Wow. Battle armor can uh, can reinvigorate that, but all right. So we mentioned that you what you love about science fiction. So what was your first memory of watching or reading or playing games in the genre? When I think back on it, um, I was a big fan of comic books, and being a kid of the '80s, they did the where they brought back in syndication Batman from the '60s, stuff like that. Uh, right. along with Gilligan's Island and all that stuff that doesn't really fall into the genre. But, you know, the original Star Trek series, Batman from the 60s. Right. Um, I think the color visually of Batman kind of popped out to me when I was like three or four years old. Yeah. I didn't know who or what Batman was, but every time he hit somebody, it said Power Zap. And I was like, oh, man, that's so cool. And then once I realized it was a comic book character, I was interested in getting comics. So as far as a reading medium and a television medium, uh, Batman was probably my first uh, love when it comes to science fiction. And I guess you kind of be iffy about whether or not it is science fiction, but, you know, he had a utility belt full of gadgets. So that would probably be right soft sci-fi, perhaps. (laughs) I could see that. And then... And then, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, when The Next Generation came out, oh, uh, you know, it was on cable, and I was, I guess I was the privileged kid to have a, what was it, a 13-inch television in my room, so yeah. I could watch <laughs> The Next Generation. So, so does and, this uh, mean you've declared your religion, Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable on both. I don't like the idea of having to choose either or um <laughs> so you're greedy. i find I like that. that yeah i am greedy i'm a selfish lover but uh <laughs> i i have to say star trek was the first one of that genre that really kind of drew me in but once i realized what star wars was i kind of appreciate i appreciate it a lot more um it was just accessibility. You know, Star Trek was on television, whereas Star Wars was, if you had a VHS, you could watch it. You know? In the books. So, uh, yes, but uh, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but my mother actually used reading as a punishment. So unless it had pictures, what? I wasn't really all that huh. interested. Yeah. Wow. She's an evil woman. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I'm not worried about her hearing this, but, uh, yeah, I mean, she used reading. I remember reading Tom Sawyer and Call of the Wild and two other books. I must have read those books about a dozen times, and I swear to you I will never read those books again because I associate it with punishment. Um, so when it came to seeing actual novels, I was not drawn to that unless it had pictures like a comic book. Uh, thankfully, I kind of outgrew that uh, once my parents split up and life kind of turned into something a little bit more normal and I discovered a love for books, but for the, probably from the time I was about six or seven until I was 13 or 14, you wouldn't see a book in my hand and me enjoy reading it. See, I was the exact opposite. I used to get in trouble for sneaking books in under my textbooks when I was supposed to be faking, like I was doing schoolwork Hmm. and I'd be reading a Stephen King Uh, novel in the fourth grade. (laughs) Oh, wow. So, I actually I to, you went a little out there. Yeah, I, like eight hundred word books. I used to get in trouble for reading instead of going to sleep at night. Oh yeah, I with the flashlight I under yeah, the book. Yeah, flashlight. Yep, I hid my flashlight and I tried to sneak the books. Did that too. 
Although, if we're being entirely honest, and I'm going to hope my mom isn't listening, but I actually only read the Stephen King novels because they didn't want me to because they weren't really <laughs> age-appropriate. So, of course, that was all the reason I needed to check them out from the library. Absolutely. He's not really my thing now, and I still I don't read them now either. I just I read them because it they didn't want me to, you know. <laughs> so you know, if I would have known that it, if I would have known it wasn't appropriate to read, I might have been a little more intrigued. But I was kind of <laughs> scared of really thick books like that. Uh, yeah, I think the first novel that I read and like really loved was What Savage Beast, which was an incredible Hulk book written by Peter David. Okay, and I've got it on my shelf somewhere. It's probably something like three hundred something pages. I think between the birth and the age of 16, that was probably the thickest book I ever read. Hmm. So, Tom, I mean, a Stephen King book is probably twice that to three times that length. Okay. Hmm. So, but uh, what about for, for games? Do you remember your first experience with uh, science fiction and games, either RPGs or, or systems? Um, I had a Nintendo and I was mostly uh, a Mario player, mm-hmm. and I had the Batman game. Uh, those are the only ones that really stand out. Oh, and Pac-Man. Uh, yeah, I wasn't. Always. I don't have a. The games that required more thought, I didn't have a lot of patience with. The ones that just kind of like you go and you jump and you hit, you know, those kind of made more sense to me. I have and then to say, with the Super Nintendo. Oh, what's that? Oh no, go ahead. I was gonna say. Uh, with Super Nintendo or N64, probably the most sci-fi-ish game I played was Star Fox. So, oh, yeah. Star Fox. I remember. forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. So I will say that uh, Batman, since you just mentioned that was one of your, your games, he ruined me, though, for the real world. Because think about all the millionaires and billionaires we have, and not one of them is running around in a bat suit. <laughs> I mean, how disappointing. <laughs> right. Because nobody's <laughs> paid me enough from yet. Them. <laughs> you know, See, that's if just, I had that bank account, rich. I would own the suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I actually remember going to the ar- arcade while my dad was out to sea and playing Space Invaders. It was an old one, but it was just it was there, and it for whatever reason drew my eye, or maybe it's because nobody else was playing it, so I didn't have to wait in line. The the arcade game that sticks out in my head is the X Men one. It was at a movie uh, theater, and I probably blew about ten dollars and quarters on that game every chance I got. Yeah, I wasn't very yeah. good at it, so, so <laughs> the ten dollars didn't last very long. <laughs> so, um, when you started writing in 2012, what de- made you decide to to take the plunge with Nano and give it a shot? And for those that don't know, that's the National November Write a Novel in a Month Camp uh, program that runs every November, where you know it encourages people to write. Right. Well, what encouraged me to do that is greed and the reason i say that is because when i turned 30 in june of that year i was doing that oh my god i turned 30 situation and i was evaluating my life and trying to determine what of my childhood goals i had accomplished and the first one was become a rock star that did not happen become an astronaut that did not happen become a comic book artist that did not happen write a book that did not happen and then, with the exception of own a house, be married, and have kids, which is probably most people's dream, uh, all the other dreams that I had that were creatively minded or scientifically minded never came to fruition. You know, I joined the Navy when I was 17, and by that point, and including now, I'm still there. But uh, when I turned 30, I just really wanted to have something to show for it. I felt like 30 years on this planet was enough time for me to accomplish something that I set out to do instead of just going with the wind. So uh, I decided that I was going to do something about it. And I hate math, so becoming an astronaut was not reasonable. Yeah, I was married with kids. And I did not want to really go on a tour bus. So trying to do the rock star thing wasn't as appealing as it was when I was 16. And then I was left with draw comics and write books. And of the two, I was dumb enough to think that because I could draw in high school, I should be able to draw, you know, at this point, 12 <laughs> years later. And those first attempts were pretty, pretty well disheartening. <laughs> and I decided to give writing a book another go. And I fell flat on my face with it. I decided I would 
do minimal research and write this fantasy novel. And it was going to be called Woe is the Fallen. And I was doing all this research on YouTube, which is my favorite form of research. Mm -hmm. And I, somehow I found out that Ernest Hemingway wrote longhanded. And then his second draft was typed. I was like, oh, well, he's a very famous writer. So <laughs> if he did that, then maybe that's a good way to go. And with the exception of having hand cramps uh, from sitting there writing longhand, which is not a typical thing that I do, uh, I didn't really get anything out of it. And I hit about ten or 12,000 words and wasn't really loving the story. And despite the fact that that was the most I'd ever written for a single project in my entire life, I decided I was going to quit. But I started getting quitter's remorse. And I was like, man, you know, I really wanted to have something to show for my 30 years on this planet. And uh, maybe I should give it another go. And as I was deciding to give it another go, I discovered National Novel Writing Month. And on the thing, it said, if you win, if you win, if you win... Winning NaNoWriMo and, you know, this stuff with having a t-shirt and a certificate on your wall and all this other stuff. That wasn't the stuff that got me. It was the get free, get five free paperback copies of your book if you successfully win NaNoWriMo. And that sold me right there. Just that wow. selfishness and wanting to have something in my hand uh, was enough to make me want to give it. <laughs> right, they don't do it anymore. So I was like... I remember the year after it was three paperbacks, and then it was one paperback, and now it's like, mm, no, you can, you can buy your own paperbacks. Um, but th that was just enough of a nudge to get me excited about trying again. I mean, of course, they had rules about it. You had to start from scratch, and all 50,000 words had to be written in one month. So uh, instead of continuing with that fantasy novel that I really wasn't digging, I decided to give it a go with si science fiction. Okay. So it sounded like you just wanted so, evidence that you had you had been here, and and a book was a good way to leave evidence behind. Yes, that's cool. Right, you know, it's kind of my footprint on this world. I didn't know I was going to get addicted to it and want to keep going. I, I was going to be <laughs> one and done. <laughs> now, did you actually publish that novel? I did. Uh, it's uh, it was my first published novel. I published it in March of. 2013, and it's called Exodus, and it's the first book of the Dead Planet series. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, well, since you write military characters in your science fiction, I think it's Amazon at least lists you as more space opera, but, I mean, it, it does have that middle SF, military sci-fi vibe. So, uh, given that you're also a veteran, I mean, ish, Navy, but <laughs> given that you're also a veteran... <laughs> Having played dress up in the Navy, do you feel this influences the, the space opera that you write? Well, I think uh, the Navy can be a very dramatic place and probably the military in general. I don't know how many service members I've talked to that said, you know, the military is like an extension of high school. You get your clicks, oh. you get your melodrama, you know, you kind of get a little bit of everything. But uh, as far as space opera is concerned, you know, who better to write about people being on a ship in the middle of nowhere for months on end? and missing home than somebody that's been on a ship miles away from home for months on end, missing home. Uh, I think when it comes to trying to explain that, that feeling, then I'm probably better qualified for doing it on a spaceship than somebody else, you know, but, uh, also knowing how the military works understanding the rank structure, understanding who would be responsible for what type of job, I think unless you serve some role in the military, you're probably not going to really understand what that is without a crap load of research. And I'm too lazy for that. And unless you've served in the Navy, you're not <laughs> going to understand what a third mizzen mast, second left-handed mate is, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever that is. <laughs> they got some I'll figure breaks. it out. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. We, we have acronyms for acronyms, you know? Yeah. You know, every time I think military acronyms, I remember that scene in uh, Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams, 
where he speaks for almost like a full several minutes and nothing but acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it all makes sense. <laughs> if you know what it means, yeah. <laughs> I was looking at a public I was I was looking at a publication and I thought it was cute that ACC is an acronym for the word acronym. But it's also <laughs> uh air conditioning circuit, you know, and different things. There there's it's just bizarre because we have acronyms that get used and misused and recycled. Hmm. It's insane. And I'm in aviation. So for all the acronyms that are on a ship, we have even more acronyms for things that are in aircraft. So if you really want to be thoroughly confused, be an Airedale on a ship and listen to some people talk, you're just like, mm, what are you talking about, man? And then, <laughs> you know, eventually you figure it out or you just play, you just play along and then, you know, is not and smile. don't let them know that you're stupid. <laughs> yeah, not and smile. Until you, you know, make it, the... I like that approach. <laughs> hey, as long as you know how to do your actual job, Stop. you don't have to. You don't have to sound intelligent. This is true. So, is it true? Do you get to hit the red button? I'll hit your red button when you're working on the planes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Well, there's a uh, there's a few Stop. red buttons, but uh, you know there are red buttons that are emergency shutoffs all over the ship, so. If you hit one, you're probably going to be in trouble. Yeah. So I just steer clear. <laughs> let somebody else hit the button. Outside. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, so outside just let of it your burn. Room, <laughs> that works. Um, so outside of your military service, what else influences your writing? Um, really, the when I need inspiration, I find it through television and movies. Uh, some of my favorite stuff is the expanse but i read all the books first so i don't really count that as being the uh sole inspiration being the the tv show but it is a very good augmentation for the books and then dark matter and killjoys uh, star wars star trek all that stuff is pretty inspiring and i'll binge on it for a little bit and then kind of reassess where i'm at it's weird now watching the stuff after writing for five or six years, because then you, you're always in the headspace of evaluating what characters are doing instead of just watching what they're doing and be like, oh, interesting story. Now you're trying to figure out the intentions of everything, <laughs> and then you can get a lot of, uh, you can get a lot of plot ideas from doing that. Do you, Do you ever find that when you when you binge on a show, that the next thing you write tends to look a lot like that show? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I, I, I'm not even going to pretend. I think it's universal. <laughs> I think everybody does that. There are some authors that won't watch in their like stuff in their genre while they're writing for that very mm -hmm. reason. Maybe that explains the, the whole subgenre of space fantasy. I, I don't think I've read any. Well, okay. Probably. I won't. Actually, I think I have read some space fantasy. Lynn Stewart stuff. Yeah. I think Lindsay Baroker does some of that too, although she does a lot of the naked shirt, romancy space stuff. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't even know where to start with yeah, that. Yeah, that's actually so. me on all of those covers. Well, we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's oh so modest, people. Oh so modest. Everybody says so. <laughs> well, that's how they yeah, need to the ships. I mean, six back abs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you don't. You know, if you don't have an ego to stroke, you don't have a pet on deployment. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to have something you can sit there like <laughs> Dr. Evil and, and pet, you know? And that just has to be you gloating about how awesome you are. That works. I've See, got 17 is, and a half years this experience This is totally different, than, <laughs> totally different than my experience deployed with the Army. I remember for us, we were just too busy getting the sand out of, you know, crevices where sand wasn't <laughs> supposed to be. And ducking. Oh, at appropriate I understand intervals. you don't. And I understand you don't want to say what that area was, but okay. <laughs> Where's your imagination? <laughs> well, well <laughs> God help you all. So, well, the sand was horrific when we were overseas, and then uh, I remember sitting there when you could smell outside a Kuwaiti naval base, and you could smell the salt in the air. And, and I called my dad because this is right before we went in country and I was talking, you know, hey, I made it safely. And he's like, bet you wish you joined the Navy now, don't you? <laughs> well, I have to so, say we anyway. saw the sand, too, but we saw the sand four days at a time. So we go to like Dubai or Bahrain. 
you know, very tame places to be at. Hmm. So I can, I can only imagine, man. Sometimes. Uh, you know, they talk about everybody's in danger, this, that, and the other. And the Navy is paranoid that something bad's going to happen. So you're always doing these drills and just to make sure if crap hits the fan that nobody's going to die. Or at least not everybody's going to die. But holy cow, man. Like, the but- friends that I have had in the Army and the Marines, their exper- their explanations of what deployment's like is night and day for mine. Hmm. So, on a, you know, being real, well, I mean, that's, that's don't some let crazy them, stuff. Don't let them lie to you either. There are plenty of people that sat in air-conditioned little Quonset huts in the middle of wherever, you know, playing on a computer. So, not everybody yeah, was a but, door kicker. Yeah, but we call the the Air Force. <laughs> or the chair force. <laughs> so, well, let's uh, let's take a break from the bashing the Air Force. They can't help themselves, bless their hearts, and uh, get a word from our sponsor. Hey, listeners, Josh Hayes here, co-host of Keystroke Media. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Sci-Fi Shenanigans. I tell you, we're really excited about what JR and Chris are doing with the podcast, and are proud to feature them as part of our podcast partner network. When you get done listening to this episode, I'd like to invite you to come check out our own podcast at keystrokemedium.com. You can find all our previous episodes and check out all the amazing authors we've had on the show. If you're free on Mondays, mark your calendars for 11 a.m. Come hang out with us as we talk to today's leading science fiction and fantasy authors and other industry professionals. We've got a great live audience who get into a lot of shenanigans of their own, as JR and Chris can attest. That's every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, live on Keystroke Media. We're going to talk about some reading, we're going to talk about some writing, and of course, everything in between. And now I'll let you get back to some more shenanigans with JR and Chris. Have a great day. I didn't touch it. All right. So thank you for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> touch <what? laughs> so, silly sailors. So thank you for sponsoring this. Uh, thank you for sponsoring this episode, Drew. So um, I remember finding you with your first book of your Alorian War series. It's the first book of you I noticed. It was uh, you had talked about it in the Hampton Roads NaNoWriMo group that we're both members of. So why don't you uh, tell us about the premise of that? Because it's it's I think it's interesting. Right. So basically, if you take Star Wars, where they have an empire and a rebel alliance. That was kind of the, let me have some big bad guys and some little good guys to uh, have an intergalactic war with. And how I wanted to do it was I didn't want anything kind of like the Force or anything like that. I just wanted spaceships blowing each other up. Uh, I had just got done reading the first few books of The Expanse. I was on deployment. I was ready to come home. I wanted to have something to show for the deployment other than another ribbon. And... Uh, that was kind of the first idea that came to my mind. Uh, I'd just seen The Force Awakens. I had all this fodder for inspiration bouncing around in my head. And the first thing that I did was I wrote a short story that I wanted to submit. It was called The Replicade, which is the name of the ship. And when I sent it to my editor, she sent it back to me with the corrections. And she goes, huh, this is pretty good. Maybe you should write a book. And I was like, yeah, I ain't got time for that. I'm on deployment. But the more it just kind of resonated with me, and maybe I should write a book, maybe I should. Uh, I've got a few months before we get home, which turned out to be more than a few months because we got extended. I decided to go ahead and give it a try. I wasn't going for the 50,000 words in a month. I was going for write something before I get home approach. So that's what I did. I, uh, I had a really good crew of people working for me. We would, we did everything together. We went to chow together, this, that, and the other. So that close knittedness of people in a shop, despite there being a rank difference, everybody knew whose position was what, uh, within that work center. I was kind of like, maybe if there was a crew that was like that, everybody got along, they did everything together. Uh, what would that be like? especially in the midst of an intergalactic war. So I just started writing. I had two point of view characters, people on both sides of the railroad track, so to speak. And uh, I didn't really outline it. I just kind of wrote by feel and pants the crap out of it. And I had 
two beta readers that were on deployment with me. So I'd finish a chapter or two, staple them, print them out, staple them together, hand them to them, ask them to, you know, underline any grammar mistakes that you might see. And I would literally ask them questions after they got done, like, what do you think about this, that, and the other? And they would answer it. So where the premise began as kind of being uh, something similar to if you took Star Wars and the Expanse and put them in a bowl and shook them out and poured some crap out, it ended up being this uh, story that kind of dealt with planetary annihilation and people being afraid of a force that they didn't know how to overcome, but also having that intestinal fortitude of wanting to do something about it if they were in a position to. So you have a character who was part of that oppressive force who sees it as being an evil thing and runs away from it. Uh, and then you have somebody that was brought up to be someone to stand against that force and their world gets destroyed. And then you have these other characters that have nothing to do with the two main characters, but they end up being uh, very important in their lives and in their survival. And now that they're all relying on each other to survive as they're running away from this empire. And then as the series progresses, they encounter other things. You end up realizing that maybe this empire is not so bad after all, because there's darker forces looming ahead. So, uh, the series matures with each book and that was kind of the premise for the first one without having much in the way of planning it out at first. But once that book, the first book was done, I was like, okay, I need to figure out what I'm doing. Like, where is this going? And once I had a little bit of an idea with it, it's going to be probably nine to 10 books long. Awesome. Well, that was the, the first idea that you said you sort of pants out the first right. book. So how do you keep coming up with ideas to keep the story moving so you don't just end up repeating the same vibe in different settings? Well, I, uh, I noticed that with The Expanse, I kind of borrowed the model a little bit, if you will. Um, in order to broaden the worldview, they add more characters. So whenever you're experiencing a worldview from a different perspective, it opens up this, the world a bit more. And then because it's in an intergalactic war, you get to put people in different places. You get to have organizations that are plotting for different outcomes to either for or against the empire. Alliances get formed. People get betrayed. Uh, and people make dumb decisions that lead them to these uh, situations that they need to get out of. So it's, it actually happens kind of organically. Uh, I jokingly make it so that the second book's about a, a space pirate, and the third book is about a mutiny on a ship because some guy's an a hole. You know, the fourth book, Shadow Empire, it's literally about an organization that's going against the Empire, but they're in the shadows. Nobody knows about them. It's a secret operation. And literally, their capabilities would allow them to defeat the Empire. But they're also a sinister force. So is it a situation where, you know, the devil you know or the devil you don't know? And that has not come to fruition yet. And as of as of us speaking right now, I'm writing the fifth book, which is Regime Change. And you end up discovering some characters that are affiliated with the Empire, but not on such good terms. And maybe they have something to gain by defeating the emperor. Uh, so everything kind of is leading towards this big war where everybody dies at the end. And that's not really a spoiler. I'm making that up. But uh, <laughs> eventually it's going to get to a point where it's all out war. And if you have the empire stay, there's going to be a lot of the same stuff happening, which isn't good. If this organization takes over, they're not good people either. If you have some type of, for lack of a better term, rebel alliance that defeats them, how can they sustain against two entities that could come back to defeat them? So 
just because it'll be the end of the series doesn't really mean it's the end of where that could go. You know what I'm saying? Nice. Yeah, I, I get that. A lot of authors, because you have series fatigue if the series goes on, like we're talking like, was it 20 books in the Honor oh, Harrington yeah. world? So a lot of authors, they'll have smaller series, but the same universe. So, I mean, I could see that as a viable uh, market strategy. So where do you see the series overall going? And how do you determine when you're going to transition from this series is ending, but the next chapter is beginning? Um, how do you make that decision? Well, I have issues with starting stuff in the middle of another project, which I decided that 2018 was going to be the end of that, that I needed to finish up the series. And I ultimately know where it's going. And I know that once I'm done with the current line of the series, I want to write one prequel that kind of explains how everything initially started. Because in my mind, knowing what started everything is it's sci-fi but it's also political intrigue and i find that to be pretty interesting and i told myself i'm not going to be able to write that until i finish this the regular part of the series and i'm excited enough to kind of see it through to the end to not want to start any other projects so knock on wood i don't start anything else until i finish the series um and already have it <laughs> mapped out in my head. Vaguely. Now, now for the fans that are listening, I want you to, for for the fans <laughs> that are listening, I need you to know that is not Drew knocking on Chris's marine head. All right, <laughs> we are not in the same building. Chris is okay. No, Chris's were hurt in the filming of this episode. All right, continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after you finish the uh, the Alorian War series in the prequel. Um, are you going to write more in that universe, do you think? Or are you going to branch out and write different science fiction universes? I'm going to branch out. I, uh, I'm i a little bit of a liar because I said I was going to finish this series before I start anything new. But I'm already starting to develop some ideas with another guy to co-author something. And then we're going to work on that kind of in between our own projects. And then uh, after the Elorian Wars, I have a book called Skyburn that I'm going to write. Uh, I'm actually about halfway through that one now, but I stopped so I could try to finish this other stuff. And then uh, from there, you know, I don't, I don't really know where I'm going. I Just to finish this series will take me to the end of 2018 or maybe a little bit into 2019. So I don't want to stress myself out too much by having 20 books you know going through my mind but I want to do something with battle mix that's something I'd like to do um yeah I think once I finish the Lorian Wars I think doing stuff on spaceships is going to be a little bit old to me so I, I want to branch out and do something a little bit different maybe a space station because you know Spaceship and space station are two different words. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll do that for myself as a quick <laughs> reward for finishing the series. Sure, palate cleanser. But it's so far out yeah. now. You know, it's really really hard to uh, to plan. Yeah, and you've got the navy breathing down your neck, wanting you to do things like show You'll up to work up. and. Oh my in gosh, the man! Like you know this. This zero six thirty muster stuff, man, and then they want you to be there all day. Like, man, who signs up for this crap? You know, <laughs> as it is, I already wake up at four o'clock in the morning just to get zero the words down. That was after know? we'd already. Finished. Yep. Oh yeah, you already did your three mile hike. Gee, such slackers. Yeah. Heck yeah. Well, I mean, we had to stop for See, donuts so first. When I was know? in the Kinda army, I was in the light infantry. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought you said you weren't an MP. Ah, oh, but a boom. All right. But yeah, we, uh, I, I thought light infantry mean I carried less. So I volunteered for that nonsense. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, before we transition to other topics, we want to talk to you about, we'll give you a second for some shameless plugging. So where can people oh, okay. find you? Well, my website is dreavery.com. And I have an Amazon page. I have a Facebook page. 
you know, just like everybody else, um, buy my books. There's that shameless plugging. But in all seriousness, uh, I think <laughs> everybody who's written as many books as I have, they probably have their favorite. And the Alorian Wars truly is my favorite series. I wrestled with wanting to write military sci-fi for a long time because I didn't want to write about what I w- my everyday life was. It was kind of how I was looking at it. Um, but there's a little bit of comfort in writing stuff that you're familiar with, that you can resonate with. And hopefully people see that in that series that, that I truly do love writing space opera now, which is something that I did not anticipate. So if anyone's interested in the series, you can get the first book for 99 cents and you'll be able to get through the first four books by the end of February. The fifth book should be out and I'm going to keep plugging away until I finish the series this year. So hopefully you guys will check that out. Outstanding. Now enough about your book. Shut up, shut up. Your time is over. So uh, what are you reading in the genre since we're speaking of science fiction? What are you reading right now? Well, I've got Nemesis Games in the Expanse series I'm going through. And then I have Infinity Engine by Neil Asher. That is in my to-read to pile. And I have a couple of Star Wars comics I want to go through. <laughs> All right. And uh, if I can quit shoveling snow, maybe I can get to at least sit down and read a comic book. Yeah, I had to do some of that today. I think I became a uh, frost. What are you reading? So I've uh, I've watched this expand. So I downloaded the novels, um, the ebooks. But I have this firm rule: if I start with the movie or the the, sh- the TV adaptation, I finish that before I read it, and vice versa. Because otherwise, you spend the whole time comparing. But if you do them separately for some reason, accepting them as different versions of the same story doesn't bother me. So I haven't, I haven't um, read the experience yet, although I, I do buy them as they come out right now. I am um, starting book four of the uh, galaxy's edge universe stuff by Jason on Spock and Nick Cole. Great series. Uh, I'm enjoying that. It's uh, everything I loved about star Wars. Oh, okay. So ha- have you read any of them? I haven't. I think I have the first book on my Kindle. But I'm terrible about reading stuff on my Kindle though. Like, Usually I'll I'll buy the book from a buddy and be like, oh man, this looks good. And I'll usually I'm not in a place to start reading right right away whenever I see it. So I'm like, oh man, let me grab this and I'll read it later. Next thing you know, it's a year's gone by and huh. I'm going through my Kindle. I was like, man, where'd all this stuff come from? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Or if is if it's a hardback or a paperback it's sitting on my sitting on my shelf staring at me. You know, I don't even know where my Kindle is right now. I read them on my it's iPod. Hiding from me, probably. But uh, I haven't actually read those. Well, if you like Mill SF. Yeah, actually, I get most of my reading done on my phone whenever I'm pretending to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> if his boss is. See, uh, actually, there is a. There's, there's a. There's, <laughs> there's a craft book on my. Oh, what's going on here? How do you get this out of here? On my phone, it's How to Write Pulp Fiction by James Scott Bell. Okay. I actually, that's my most recent thing that I'm reading on my Kindle because I read it whenever I'm sitting in line or something. Yeah, I do a lot of reading on my yeah, phone. Yeah, man. But... Like, it's kind of embarrassing how many books I have on my Kindle. I had nothing embarrassing about reading. So, um, have you read um, any of the ones he mentioned, Chris? The Expanse, the Star Wars. Well, I've read some of the Star Wars books. I didn't know there were comics, though. Oh, I've but, read or the Infinity. You talking about the Infinity Gauntlet series? It's Marvel. Uh, yeah, Infinity Engine. Infinity Engine, no. But I've read probably no. thirty Star Wars. No, books. Infinity Engine by Neil Asher. Okay, so he hasn't read that because he's thinking about uh, comic books. Who yeah, says I actually got the, grow up? I got a comic recently. Yeah, growing up, man, I just grow out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Chris, you haven't read obviously Infinity Engine if you're getting the title wrong, but uh, yeah, have, you, have you read the Expanse read stuff? No, I haven't read that either. Have you seen the TV show? Nope, I hardly watch television. Uh, yeah, my problem is most of what I like on TV I can't watch when the kids are up. What are you doing, Marine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, writing a lot and 
I am reading, but just not uh, not that right now. I'm, I'm trying to pick up some of the classics and learn from some of the old masters. Right now, I'm reading Robot Visions, uh, collection of short stories by Isaac Asimov. Yeah, I've read that. What about the Star Wars? Have you read any of those? No, oh, I've read probably 30 Star Wars books. The entire Yuuzhan and Vong series was fantastic. Yeah. I, I have, um, I've read parts of those. Um, and then, you know, when I got to college and deployment, I just didn't have a lot of time for reading. So I've got to get back into them. There's just so much sci-fi to choose from these days. There is. It's fantastic. See, that's a, that's a difference between all... That's the difference between Army and Navy deployments. You don't have time to read, but on the Navy, that's that's all you do. I'd probably read a book every week or two weeks, depending on how big it is. Yeah. Well, 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 I mean, whereas when I'm at every- home, you know, so stuck doing other stuff and then making time for reading. Well, well, again, like I said, everybody's deployment in the Army is different. Not everybody had the, the job I had. And, you know, so there are some, I'm sure, who had time. I just didn't. Uh- but anyway, I was the idiot that volunteered to go in the infantry. So um, <laughs> speaking of idiots, we'll transition to talking about science. So are there any new um, scientific breakthroughs that you're following or excited by as you research for your, for your writing? I don't really do scientific research for my writing. I do scientific research because I'm excited about the future. So um, one of the things that I recently read about probably a week or so ago was Tesla developed an electronic rig, 18-wheeler tractor. (laughs) And that's interesting to me because my dad's a truck driver, and he's been doing it for about 40 years. And what's interesting to me about it isn't the fact that now they have an electric Yeah, we've been going back and forth on the uh, self-driving cars. Right. Well, this isn't self-driving. It's just an electronic, kind of like if you had a Mack truck and you turned into a Prius, you know, one of those situations. Oh. And I can't wait to hear my dad complain about it because right. he's so, he's so colorful in his language, you know, with the four letter words that he, when he's like, my company made us buy this electronic pieces of, you know what? And he's going to be like, Oh, I don't get any, you know, torque on it. And he's going to go all about how it's the most terrible thing in the world to have an electronic <laughs> tractor to be pulling his trailer with. And I just, you know, I'm looking forward to that. So I hope his company is one of the first ones to buy it so I can laugh at them. Uh, the <laughs> self-driving cars, on the other hand, I'm excited about and scared of at the same time. There's a lot of anxiety with that because um, I read something about self-driving cars is going to happen. I got super excited, except for the fact that I might not be able to afford it. And then I read this thing where it's talking about what if AI has to determine who's going to die in an accident? Does that AI that's driving the vehicle protect the people inside the vehicle, or does it try to be a good? Oh my steward? god, I read that too. Yes, and like you're all like excited, like oh man, we're gonna get self-driving cars going home to visit families. Gonna be like I'm gonna I'm gonna sleep. I'm gonna read a book, watch YouTube videos on my phone, and then I'm like, nope, not getting one of those because then it's gonna determine who dies. And what if I'm the expendable one? You know, so I don't know. Maybe maybe I should read stuff with a grain of salt, but. I typically yeah. don't do that. I usually kind of go high and right with what I'm thinking about and it becomes the end of the world. And then I write a book so, about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I listen to, um, speaking of the craft, like I, I spend a lot of time driving to appointments and in waiting rooms between my wife's health issues and my time at the VA. So I listen to, for writing stuff, I listen to Joanna's, Joanna Penn's the creative pin podcast. And she's like, all into the futurisms like she's all in for that and every time i hear her talk about this stuff and i'm just thinking you want skynet to go live this is <laughs> how skynet goes live. Get ants. <laughs> that's right <laughs> <laughs> this is how the apocalypse happens yeah but, will eat your brains. But, it's, but, it's, but it sounds like a good i but but you gotta admit that the apocalypse sounds better coming from somebody with a british accent like it sounds like it's going to be okay. It does, <laughs> yeah. Because they sound smart like when they say regal. it, you know, <laughs> with their proper English. Yeah, much more regal. These are the queens, I, people. I, I love it when I love it when she says schedule. <laughs> I'm easy to please. <laughs> but um, so, what what about you, Chris? Well, any of the breakthroughs you're watching besides? Uh, the self-driving cars and the hacking potential. I'm still keeping an eye on Google's 
AI engine they're building, DeepMind. Um, they've successfully it it can win at Pong. It can play Pong all day long and keep winning, but it cannot beat Super Contra yet. But they've hit every mark that they they're trying to hit to actually have a fully functional AI that they can throw problems at, like uh, how do we get rid of all the house flies in the entire world? Or, you know, what, what's the answer to the universe? And as I go, the answer is 42. They're, they're making this AI, which is scary because this is how Skynet is formed. I agree. I agree. This is how it all starts. It's all fun and games. So someone shoots their eye out. <laughs> That's right. So. For me, the one that I'm watching is because this has a lot of impact on both now, space travel. You know, I don't. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, uh, I don't open up every article that I see, but I do read every headline. And I, did you see the one about the, they're saying that he was talking about hacking and everything, where the sex robot could be hacked by people to turn it into a murderer. Yes, I saw that. I actually read the article. It was very it wasn't as um risque as you would think. They're just talking about the the basically personal robots in general. It wasn't as the the title was clickbait. It worked. People clicked it, but but the article was just talking about, you know, robotic butlers in general and and how all of those could be hacked to murder you in your sleep. Hmm. That would make a good book. So, for me, yeah. it would so for me, I, I've been watching some of the farming breakthroughs because they have, you know, applications to both the population concerns for you know population overload and, and for potential space travel and colonization. But they've um, they've got an artificial leaf. This was reported in the Scientific America's 2017 breakthroughs list that they just published last month in December, um, and they've got an artificial leaf that turns CO2 into liquid fuel. Oh, what? so not only does that solve solve some of the food issues if it works. Potentially, you know, it could be a um, an energy revolution. I, I think that's going to be interesting. And uh, I'm not sure I'd want to eat something that creates fuel. Well, I I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if you think about recycled water, we'll leave it right there when it comes to uh, <laughs> space travel in general. But uh, transitioning yeah. uh, finally, since we spoke of the end of the year predictions, let's talk about 2018. So uh, where do you see the science fiction going in 2018? Drew? Probably going to be more funny sci-fi. Stuff that's kind of like uh, yes. Barry Hutchinson's Space Team or like the Pew Pew anthologies that we're putting out uh, where everybody's kind of doing stuff for laughs instead of everything being being morbid and dystopian type sci-fi. Especially this year, I think uh, I don't know probably the last two or three years, I think dystopian has kind of gotten a little closer to what people complain about on social media all the time. So people are looking for stuff to laugh at instead of stuff to get them all angry and riled up. So they're, they're probably going to do that instead of more of the really dark sci-fi that's been coming out lately. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually uh, when Chris and I made our show notes for this episode that was actually what he was thinking about. Of course, I'm still going to write the, my, myself. <laughs> that's actually what he was mentioning. He thought that the funny sci-fi was going to make a decent comeback. And I actually specifically said I thought books will be more fun because, you know, escapism again instead of message fiction that's, you know, both sides trying to convince you they're, they're right and disguising it as a novel. Yeah. So uh, at least the three of us are on the same page there. But – um Chris is pointing out that we are running up on time. So, Drew, do you want to tell them again where they can find you real quick? Go to DrewAvery.com. My last name is spelled A-V-E-R-A. Uh, it's pronounced a little different than it's spelled. But uh, you can find me there, and uh, you can also find me on Amazon. I'm pretty exclusive to Amazon right now. So if you have a Kindle, I'm your man. Outstanding. Or the app. Let's not forget. So, um those will be in the show notes if you didn't uh, have a pen handy. And um, Chris, why don't you? T yeah, Chris, why don't you tell people how they can find us? Okay, you can find us at www.sfshenanigans.com. That's Sierra Fox Trot Shenanigans.com, or Twitter at sfs Sierra Fox Trot Sierra underscore Show, or email us at podcast at sfshenanigans.com.
because there are many SFS podcasts, but we are the only show in town. <laughs> That's right. I just thought of that on the spot too. Golf clap. Golf clap. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. Boom.